Welcome everyone today. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Kamijamara people of the Ma Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And can I also acknowledge the great gift that we have here in Australia, which is to be part of the longest continuous culture in the world, a culture of storytelling and of bearing witness that we should be grateful to walk alongside. Uh, it gives me really great pleasure to be here with Jess today and to introduce her to you. Jess is a foodie, a writer, a podcaster and an all-round um, multi-talented human being. Um, Jess joins us today to reflect, as Jock said, on um, their memoir, Raised by Wolves, which I absolutely ripped through. I don't know if other, others have had a chance to read it yet. It's very much a one scene book. Um, it's absolutely cracking read. Um, you can't buy a copy here, but if you head down to Blindy Books, there are plenty of copies there. And if you um, if you just circle around, I'm sure you'll be able to find Jess to sign it for you um, before she heads off at the end of the weekend. And how lucky are we also to be having here a conversation about food and hospitality in Port Perry's delightful Mary G kitchen. Um, well, um, rightly renowned. Um, Jess, I wanted to start um, with, a, I guess, a more global reflection about the food industry. Um, certainly at elite levels, it seems one that's quite dominated by a certain type of man. Um, charismatic, but probably pretty uncompromising. And in Australia, it's also been one that's pretty relentlessly white. So how do you think that rarefied world compares with your own experience? And how important was it to challenge that idea in your memoir? Well, uh, in my experience, it was incredibly white. It still is incredibly white. Anyone who gets an accolade is white. Their kitchens are usually run by free labour uh, of like teams of people who are sourced from all over the world to pick tiny things and do the very uh, meticulous, thankless jobs. So these people can sit there with their Sandpell Awards and say, look how great I am. Uh, it's pretty much the same in Australia because Australian people try to emulate world-class restaurants. But there is a turn now uh, because, you know, fair work. People like to get paid for things they do. I certainly don't work for free. Um, but in terms of challenging that in my memoir, it's kind of like, well, first of all, I'm not a white man. <laughs> and uh, a lot of front of house are not men, the majority of them aren't. A lot of people in the kitchens, everyone kind of holding up the backbone of these kitchens with front-facing white faces. Uh, it, it, it is like anyone in there doing the thankless jobs, like washing dishes and like all the prep, they're not white. And you know, I think we need to say thank you to them and acknowledge that they are people and not free labour. Um, in one of the opening scenes, you describe the challenge of being a bored child in a restaurant as a child whose job it is to pretend not to be bored. Um, that was really familiar and charming to me because in our family, um, that was part of our... We, we spent time in restaurants, which maybe for some people in the southwest was not necessarily their experience. Um, I, so I remember being that kid, although our play thing was um, the little wrapper that went on the chopsticks and then the after dinner meal wrapper at the end of the night. Um, <laughs> after dinner meant 80s kids reckon it. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how did your perception of that time, um, and that time that seemed endless to you when you were a child, change as you grew older? Um, and what do you think it taught you both about food and about yourself? So, you know, I guess being bored around the kitchen, or like, you know, the restaurant table, you do learn how to appreciate good food and the markers of good food, and you learn life lessons, like patience and how to develop your palate and what is a good cooking technique because everyone will drill it into you. And when you're, you know, at the local Chinese restaurant or the out of suburban Chinese <coughs> restaurant, like, no one gets recognised, you know, because they probably don't speak English, they don't have ties to media, they can't afford media. Um, so they're just kind of in the background doing their thing, striving for excellence amongst the local community. Um, and for example, you know, I'm Cantonese, like I grew up in Cantonese restaurants. Everyone knows Flower Drum. Name me another. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, you know, like those life lessons of being bored. Unfortunately, I am now bored when I'm, you know, sitting in very long degustations that take all night to eat and my food tastes pre-digested. <laughs> and I'm really, really bad afterwards. And 
and then I have to write about it and not be mean, <laughs> but constructive. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like the tables have turned because I, you know, when I was a little kid, I was like, oh my God, all these great restaurants, they must be incredible. And now that I get to experience these incredible restaurants, I'm like, I like my food to taste like food. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really interesting, the idea that you have to channel that childhood boredom into the, the work that you go about now. Um, so, thank you for that question. Um, your passion for food has been a driving force for your life. Um, but it's a passion that not necessarily everyone around you has always understood or, I guess, been on board with. Um, I'm wondering, are there times that that passion has been helpful and, and kind of taken you places that you've wanted to go, and then maybe some times that that's landed you in trouble? Oh, OK, I'm going to tell you about this one time. I, was, I wrote about this restaurant when I was blogging. And um, it was one of those things where it was a small business and everything went wrong for them that night, including the fact that they, it was the middle of winter, they served everything on slate, which first of all gives me the shits, because how do you pick that up off the table? There is no link to that plate. If food runs, it runs all over the table. And I took photos of it all, so they couldn't say it didn't happen. Um, but it was so hot, it was oppressively hot in the restaurant. The butter that came with the bread not only melted, it clarified. <laughs> <laughs> and when I posted it, they were like, oh shit. And because everyone knows everyone, they ended up finding me and they're like, dude, <laughs> that was fucked. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I think I fucked it. Um, and you know, the way that it has served me is that you know, my passion for food, I actually know everything down to the technical details. I can identify things, like where they go wrong, what's technically correct, what technically didn't go well, and therefore write about it, which is how I became, you know, a food and drink editor. And I was able to mentor freelancers underneath me. Uh, and, you know, that, that's great, because they could get to learn how to do the job rather than being like, I like food. This was great. Five stars. <laughs> So that's a really interesting point about the role of um, people in that kind of industry and critiquing um, food and restaurants. So how critical do you think it is for people who are um, offering that advice to the broader public who maybe have never been to a restaurant or perhaps have never tried a particular cuisine? How important is it that that group of people are well schooled on food and understand how restaurants work? I would say incredibly so. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of people who critique food have never worked in restaurants or have done on a very low level. Uh, so when I read their critiques and I'm like, that is actually incorrect, this is what they're referencing. Um, I also think there should be a lot more diversity in food media so they can actually write about the particular cuisines that they're critiquing because there's a lot of misunderstanding that goes on and there is a very amazing food writer who just quit his job the other day, who has been doing it for 25 years, and people in this room will be like, I know exactly who that is. <laughs> um, I have been in the room with him while we've been reviewing the same restaurant, and his food will arrive, and he'll come up to me with his plate, and he'll go, what is this? This is amazing. And I'm like, dude, that is potato. If you cannot visually identify <laughs> potato, what are you doing? <laughs> I feel like that reflects very badly on him, but also maybe it reflects on a really amazing treatment of potato that no one has heard of. I wonder, um, in the book you write about being a confidant and a, and a vault for your peers and for your colleagues, um, and for really intense and personal experiences for people in your workplace. And obviously any of us who's spent time in a really intense environment knows how important that person is. Um, but being that person um, can be a really big responsibility and can be a burden. Um, I'm just wondering also to what extent did being the holder of other people's stories prepare you to tell your own and how did you kind of balance that kind of secret keeping and then having to really put everything on the page as, as a writer of your own memoir? Um. I love gossip, and I think if 
I have told you I don't love gossip, I am lying. I want all your secrets. I have all of the secrets. And, like, I love it. Like, it, it, they are stories. But what it prepared me for was how to tell a good story, because when people are telling you their secrets, they meander, they're usually a little bit drunk, they miss the point. You get ten more secrets on the way. Um, but in terms of telling my own story, it's making sure I don't incriminate anyone else, because, you know, I don't like to get sued. It's not fun. I don't have money. You can have... You know, I'm like, what are you suing me for? My shirt? Sure. <laughs> Um, it, it's a very, um, it's a very close knit community, though hospitality. I'm guessing. So, how has the experience been of people either um, imagining that they know the people of whom you're speaking? Um, how has that been for you as you've kind of navigated your way through events like this? I ask them for permission first. <laughs> uh, and, you know, certain people are really proud to be in the book and be like, yes, I was that drunk. I did do that. It's me. <laughs> um, other people were like, I'm insulted. I didn't make it in there. What about this time when we did this thing? And I'm like, do you want to go to jail? <laughs> um, but that, that's pretty much it. Like, uh, making sure I'm telling the right stories and not upsetting people. Um, and, you know, if you're being... If you're preparing to write your own memoir and you have these stories that involve other people, I suggest you ask them if you can tell the story first, so then you won't get in trouble. So that's an interesting contrast with fiction where you can, um, I guess, claim fiction and not necessarily have to navigate that same, um, that same dimension, although I know that there are plenty of people who uh, definitely imagine themselves to be in fiction that perhaps um, perhaps there's an imagined character, but they can see themselves very clearly in it. Um, anyone who's worked in hospitality will definitely see themselves in your book, regardless of whether they are specifically in it. Um, and they also know the kind of the pace and the lifestyle that it becomes over time. Um, I think it's often sort of painted as a a kind of, you know, a particular lifestyle that you do for a sort of time-limited period and one that takes a really significant toll on people's bodies. But it also teaches an enormous amount about balance and about kind of, you know, being the best version of yourself. Like, you tell stories about balancing what is a really kind of rich and robust social life against the kinds of things that you have, to, interventions you have to put in place to then make it back on shift. Um, what do you think the industry can teach people about um, about living their best life? Oh. Don't spend all your money at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, I think the thing about hospitality is that it isn't balanced. Like, I, I am an anomaly in that I could be like, that's it, I'm going home, I'm not telling anyone, otherwise you'll keep me here. Uh, and I have been that person who has worked all day, gone drinking all night, gone home, showered, and gone straight back to work to do it again. That's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when you're doing that, you're like, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> you check the clock every five minutes, and you go, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and um, somehow you do it again. Uh, but when you get to a particular age, or when you get sick of it, you kind of realise you need to grow up a little bit, save your money, maybe, you know, go to the gym, drink some water, eat a piece of broccoli, uh, because you go to the doctor and they're like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> um, I went to the doctor when I was feeling awful and they're like, you're iron deficient, you have no potassium, you're vitamin D deficient, even though you live in Australia. Um, and what else? I was deficient in everything and they're like, what do you eat? And I thought about what I ate that day and I was like, uh, the butt end of bread with olive oil. And they're like, and? And I was like, no, no, there's no and. <laughs> That's it. Like, you just have to force yourself to do it. I sat on this panel with other re uh, restaurant owners a while ago, and there was a common thing between all of us, and it's like, oh, yeah, you need to make time for yourself to do nothing. Maybe go to the gym. Maybe just lie down for the entire day. That is it. So... With that in mind, is it an industry for the young? Like, obviously, there are a lot of young people in hospitality. It's a kind of gateway, um, you know, job for lots of people. It's their first job in many cases. How hard is it to stick it out? Um, it's incredibly hard because 
The general public don't treat you very well. Uh, your colleagues don't treat you very well. The kitchen doesn't treat you very well. Uh, your managers also don't treat you very well. And then you go home and your parents are like, when are you getting a real job? <laughs> um, you know, like longevity really depends on like how passionate you are. And unfortunately, in this day, with all the inflation and how expensive everything is, you can't afford to work for love. And I think everyone gets to a point where they're like, if I stay in this industry, I kind of have to sidestep and be either a brand ambassador, a rep, be a manager, transition to the back office, do events, um, you know, be a salesperson. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of what happens. Or you become an owner where you make a venue where you're like kind of proud of it and you don't have to be there all the time. Um, and you just kind of make compromises so you can actually live your life. Um, I'm wondering if you can, um, you, you obviously talk a lot about your experiences of food in the book and they're some of the most compelling um, passages in the book are the ones where you're talking about food and the way it kind of really reduces people almost to sort of fundamental state where you are responding to exactly what's in front of you at that moment. Is there a food that you wish that you could try again for the first time? Oh yeah. <laughs> Hot chips. <laughs> they are the perfect food. There is actually a scientific formula about chips and how they are the perfect food and how they're so addictive and the chemical smell that it gives off and how people respond to it. I'm like a seagull. <laughs> Amazing. What, what, a, what a brave answer in the marriage, you have to say. <laughs> um, food can be an adventure or it can be a comfort. And um, you talk a, a little bit in the memoir about the kind of varying levels of bravery that people take to it, and obviously um, your, your food critic colleague and his experience of potato, possibly not as brave as we would have liked. Um, but you seem you seem fearless. So are there still horizons in that space that are unconquered for you? Are there still things that you that you imagine yourself kind of yet to experience? Um, not really. I don't feel the need to experience the food industry any deeper. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> <laughs> Experience of food or things that they'd like to try, Jess is the expert on all things. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the craft of writing um, because writing a memoir seems a process that once you've started it, it must be really hard to know when to stop, either for the purposes of a single book or even as you kind of go on with your life when you've sort of submitted a draft to the publisher. Is it something that, that, that continues to kind of live in your mind? Um, so how did you know when it was time to start? And then how did you know when it was time to stop? I knew it was time to start because I was asked. And it was lockdown, and I was like, fine. <laughs> um, but I'm going to sound like a complete psychopath when I tell you all the process of writing this, because it was incredibly methodical. Um, I basically just wrote a chapter outline, it got approved, and then I went, great, you want 70,000 words? I did some basic maths, looked at the timeline, and I went, this is my blue sky goal, where I do a chapter a week, and then if I let myself relax a little bit, or I might lose some steam, this is the date that I will finish. Um, and I may or may not have submitted it in four and a half months. Ooh, impressive. Psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got to the end, though, you felt that that was that was done. You were you said all you had to say, or have you since kind of reflected? Either there were things that you would have included, or you know, I guess um, content for another um, memoir to come. Um, well, funnily enough, I got to the end and my editor actually said, can you write an epilogue? This seems really bleak. Um, we want people to keep going to restaurants. And I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. I don't want to be the reason why there's no more like, waiters in Melbourne. Um, what a legacy. <laughs> it's me. Um, but 
you know, it, it, it was more like a chapter of like me getting into hospital and me leaving hospitality and the way that I looked at it was like my love letter and my breakup letter and like all good ends, you just walk away. Um, but yeah, apparently that was way too bleak. They, they wanted me in a restaurant afterwards, having a good time. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we discussed when we were preparing for today was the kind of idea that um, sometimes uh, that hospitality, because of the high level of focus, because the high level of kind of turnaround and, and output that's required, um, that it, it takes discipline and it also takes a particular kind of person. But I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about um, what kind of messages you give to people in hospitality, because I'm interested in that, you know, you're not in the kind of coal face of it now. So mm -hmm. what do you think is possible for people working in that industry? Because you've obviously, um, you know, kind of moved into a whole range of areas as a result of your experience there. Yeah. Um, I guess one of my messages is if you want to stay in hospitality, work for the right operator. <laughs> work for someone who treats you like a human. Um, and then, you know, obviously if you want to do different things, understand that you're not limited to hospitality because you learn so many different skills aside from a sense of urgency because in hospitality they want everything done yesterday. They want you to do it now. I have so many friends with the same tattoo and it is on their wrist and it just says push because when you're in service, you're just going to push. You're going to keep pushing through and it's kind of like... I have that drive to, even though I'm in pain, to keep going through and I've done like so many bar awards and so many food awards and people think this is such a good job and you're like, have you been to 100 bars in six weeks and written about them, reviewed them, remembered everything you had uh, while, you know, doing your day job and you lose your evening, like it is awful and then you have to judge your peers and then at the awards people will come up to you and say I think you were wrong I should have been higher and you're like well you weren't <laughs> <laughs> okay now I have to ask a follow up question <laughs> what was the first how did you manage through the first time you had to do that did you do it with confidence because certainly judging your peers is a really like sort of intense activity, how did you kind of muster up the certainty to kind of engage in that the first time? Um, I guess it's like when you've, uh, I think one of the things is when you've worked in the industry, uh, they know that you've got a certain level of knowledge and you can back that up and, you know, they've critiqued you by going into your venue and asking you to make a drink and they're like, oh, damn, you know how to make a drink. Okay, you can tell me how I, how I fucked up. <laughs> And um, also, you know, it's just on busy nights. Uh, when you see someone who's happy to serve you a broken sour, uh, you're like, oh, that's kind of your standard, dude. Like, if you're happy to serve a broken drink, like, that's not cool. Um, interesting. <laughs> Did it get easier? Um, no, it never gets easier because uh, people, people have your phone number now. <laughs> and and they, your Instagram handle. And your Instagram <laughs> handle. And they're friends with you on Facebook and they'll send you messages about what they think. Um, I think one venue in particular, uh, all their venues are generally very good. You know, very much five-star material, always gets far in the year. And they opened a new venue that was more focused on food and that is not their thing. Like, you know, they served oysters that had dried up when were warm from the past lamps. Like, the service was slow, there was no salt on things, and then they, it, it actually affected their drink service. And because I'd gotten to know these owners <coughs> over a over time, and my kind of measuring stick is, if I've had a drink with you in a social situation, I'm not going to review your restaurant because that, or bar, because I will be biased. So I sent a new drinks reviewer and I said, keep all this in mind if you have any questions because, you know, you're getting into this, like, let's work on the thing. They were very generous with their rating and I thought they were very generous. I was like, are you sure you want to give them this rating? And they were like, yes, 
kind of. It's in between this and this, but I thought I'd be nice. And I'm like, okay. Got published and I got a message on my phone within five seconds of it getting published because they love themselves so much they have Google alerts out on themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and all the text message said was, what the fuck? And I receive messages like that on a regular basis. And it's like, read it. It's like, it's all in there. We're very constructive. And in certain cases, I'm like, it could have been worse. I could have reviewed it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in days, obviously, so you had a reviewer trying to be nice, that still wasn't what the venue expected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for Jess that they would like to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Chris Flynn, ABC. No, I'm just. Uh, Chris is here to complain about the review you left for his restaurant. <laughs> I wrote that thing about Jess being terrifying on the cover of the book. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering, Jess, um, you're always a good cook ever since I've known you for many, many years. Have you become a better cook as a result of the your experience in the industry? Uh, definitely, because not only do you learn tricks and different techniques, you also become literally desensitized to heat. So mm -hmm. you develop flavor from the Maillard reaction and everything. And, now I'm like, oh, I don't feel like washing that utensil, and I will literally put my heat in the, my hand in the fire and be like, oh, it's better for it. Yeah, it's good. And then you can actually feel feel the perfect point that it is cooked on your hand, and you're like, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. And you know that moment is what makes great cooking. And you know you taste things a lot more. You, it's just being exposed to different people and the way they do things because. Unfortunately, in hospitality, you learn that there is only one right way, unless it is someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> so have you become like a chef, in a way? Um, so the venue that I owned, like, I, I'm actually a qualified chef, oh. because <laughs> I did all my certs. So, um, yeah, but like, I didn't work in the kitchen until my venue that I opened myself, and I was doing the wines, I was doing cocktails, I was doing all the food, and I was the dishy. I basically just had one staff member on the floor to make sure I didn't get rolled. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, was your restaurant reviewed and if so, by who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it was. By all the major media outlets, it was even up for Gourmet Traveller Bar of the Year, the year that it was, it, it was in the world. <laughs> I did not win. <laughs> <laughs> but no retribution? No. Excellent. I'm like... So the system works? That. Yes, it works. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Jess? Jo? Well, I'm do you have a question? Up. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I hand over to you now, Jo? Perhaps. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much to these two, um, to Jess and to Emily. Um, this has been fabulous. Yeah. We're, we're going to take a little break and have eat some drinks and things for the next 20 minutes or so, mm -hmm. and then uh, Michael with uh, trunks are on and just, uh, Jennifer down. <laughs> we'll be here. I'm a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.